finished, amen, well, maybe you did know, we finished our series on destiny, and we were actually doing two simultaneously back and forth, talking about destiny, amen, your importance to God and the kingdom of heaven. But we've also been talking about, amen, the tree of life, which is the communion table, which I turn an actual true name, the tree of life. Remember last time we were together, we, we quoted a scripture to you from the book of Revelation, amen, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So stop and think about it for a minute. The word of our testimony. That's the aspect of the word that has become a reality in our life. Amen. Now, you can testify to something that you are aware of and you do not have, but you cannot overcome. Huh? I want to say it again. You can testify to something that you are aware of, that you've heard, but you do not presently have, but you cannot overcome with it. Amen? Truth, the Word of God is given to us that we might overcome with it. Overcome what? Overcome not only the sins in our own life, the darkness in our own life, but the darkness that is around us. Amen? So truth, the word, is what? The bread. The bread of life, right? So look at it this way from now. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the bread of life. So it's a reason that the writer, amen, um, put this particular truth fittingly in the book of Revelation. The, the book that depicts the last days. If you do not have a revelation of who Jesus is to you, as he revealed himself to you as the blood and the wine. The writer is saying to you, you won't survive what's coming. Amen? Now, I've heard, I know you've heard me say this. And brother and sister, when I say words like this in preaching, there is this awareness on the inside of me that I cannot explain, that I see, that I understand. That's coming. You heard me say before, you who have been around a while, or a while who are over 50, you've seen our world change. not just from a global standpoint, but from where you live. To many, that is your world because many have never been out of the state. That is their world, their surroundings. You've seen it change. Many do not understand the spiritual implications that has embedded itself within the change. And as the changes occur, we who are Christians should be changing for the better. The light of God comes not only to reveal to us what's going on around us, but for us to reflect Amen. The dual nature of this world, the good and the evil. Because remember, there were two trees in the garden. The tree of life and the tree of good and evil. Eve could not see the evil of what she was doing. Because of the so-called good that was being told her. The good was you will be like God. 
knowing. But she was lied to. Amen. So in cloaked in the so-called good message was an evil that she could not come back from. None of us could. And so the world as we know it today with sin is because she ate of the tree of good and evil. So you and I, amen, as children of light, our responsibility is to project the tree of life. Your life, the testimony of your life is not just what you say, but what you do, how you live, should cause people to be able to discern the evil that is in this world. Right? Look at the life of Jesus. The Bible said he went about doing good. Why? He was the bread that came from heaven. He was the true bread. Amen. And so in in so doing, his life, amen, captured the essence of who God was. But it also exposed evil. Amen? He exposed the flaws that was in the law. He exposed the lies that were in the law. He exposed what religion had done to man. How the Ten Commandments, amen, or Ten Statements, what it literally says in the Hebrew, how it was captured, amen, and falsified, if you would, through religion. So, brothers, so what am I saying to you? For someone to see error, there must be light. Amen. You are called to be that light. Now, keep in mind, there is also dark light. Wrapped within the tree of life is this dark light. People through ignorance eat of this dog light and think that they have embraced something good. Amen. Just like all of those who knowingly worship Lucifer, there are many in our government that are Satan worshipers who worship Lucifer. There are many in big corporations that have money that you would never dream of that worship Lucifer. And Lucifer, who is the father of lies, the Bible says, lie to them and tell them that he will rule, he will have a place for them. And they believe the lie. So where it is the where it is the person who has billions and billions of dollars, you know, like your, your, uh, your like Gates, Bill Gates, or the man who's sitting on the corner, amen, trying to get a dime to find a to, 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 to get a bottle to drink. The lie is the same. The strength of the lie is the same. He wants their soul. Now Lucifer knows to a certain degree he cannot win. But he believes his own lies. He ultimately believes that if he can get the church, the body, to turn against the Lord, that he will win this planet. This is what he wanted all along, this planet. Amen. That piece of land in the Middle East called Israel. Because he knows that is all in God's plan. Amen. For the future. So are you. Do you hear me? So are you. Rick Jonah tells a story in his book called The Final Quest. In his encounter and his experience in heaven. He was called to remember a man he met in heaven. 
He said the man exuded love. It was something that could not be put into words. When the man came and hugged him, his knees almost buckled under the weight of the love that came from this man. And the Lord Jesus said to, to Rick, you remember him? Rick said, no, I don't. The Lord said, yes, you do. And the Lord calls him to remember him. This man had gotten saved because someone left a track in a phone booth. And this man, like many homeless people do, was seeking some place to get warm. So he went inside this phone booth. And the Lord's grace was exemplified and opened up this man's eyes. And he saw the reality of Jesus and who he was. And the man was born again. Now, the Lord is telling this story, and this man is standing beside the Lord. And Rick John is standing in front of the Lord. And the man did not supernaturally take the man off the street. The Lord did not supernaturally take the man off the street. He did not supernaturally give him a place to stay. Any of that. The man continued to live on the street. To eat out of the trash can. But his love for the Lord grew more and more. And Rick Jonah was called to remember that he came out of a building one day. And this homeless man, dirty, had sold bottles, spent all the money he had to buy more tracks, remembering what had happened to him. And so he was out in the street, you know, waving tracks and talking about Jesus. And <laughs> Rick walked past the man and says, that's what gives us a bad name, many of us Christians. And this is what Rick was called to remember, standing there in front of the Lord. Rick said, I dropped my head in shame. And that man continued on, barely living, barely finding something to eat. And the angels... Begged the Lord, bring him home. Bring him home. Free him from his suffering. But the Lord didn't. And so this man that's standing there, exemplifying the pure love of Christ, died. And so Rick said, Lord, how did he die? He said he died trying to keep another homeless man warm. And he froze to death. And so what was so outstanding and what Rick found so unbelievable because he was standing before the throne of the Lord. But prior to him seeing this man, he was seated on a throne with the Lord. <clears throat> Remember what the apostle John wrote. He that overcometh will sit with me in my throne even as I overcame. Now, brother, sister, did Jesus have an easy life? Now, look at what Jesus had Versus what he was born into. He was God. He possessed everything. And he gave it up. To come into this world. For you. 
He didn't come for himself. Jesus didn't need salvation. He didn't need saving. We did. He gave it all up. Now compared to what he gave up and what you gave up is nothing. <laughs> huh? What we gave up was killing us anyway. He did it for us. You, 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 you know the story. He was not born in a king's palace. He was born in a stable. Huh? In a stable, no home. His parents had no home. Yet he was a king. And so his life was as such, even his ministry. The Bible said he was sent to his own and they received him not. So there's two major things that Jesus experienced that you will experience in your pursuit of him. Difficulty and rejection. This is one of the biggest things that the enemy uses to destroy people in general. Not just Christians, but people in general. Rejection. And so when we come to the Lord, the Lord passes through all of that. Endeavoring to do what? Reach us. Cause us to experience his love beyond the rejection that we experience by being in this world. Some overcome that. Many do not. Many allow that rejection to crush them as a person. Ultimately, they leave this world without knowing the pure love of God. How that love can change them, transform them, and help them change others. Amen? There is a reason that the enemy attacks families. Break up families. Fatherless families, motherless families. There's a reason he do it. He does it. If he can seat within mankind this rejection, he increases the chances of them rejecting God throughout their life. A true father. Amen. That thing is seated inside of you. It's seated inside of you. And you go throughout life actually looking for love. But when we come to God, we don't realize that we have embraced the epitome of love. A person that knows everything about you and is not impeded by that and loves you regardless. Huh? What human would do that? None. None. If you had to tell someone Everything that you had done, everybody you have slept with, everything that you have done, before they embraced you, what chances 
do you have of them accepting you for who you are? If that's what you had to do. It's very little chances. But the Lord does it regardless. You have to understand God is not like man. His love is beyond comprehension. Amen. So be, Rick saw this man seated in the throne with the Lord. There were many others there. Those thrones was mostly filled by women and children, not men. Women and children. What does that tell you about the pride and the arrogance of men? And so that's when the Lord stepped toward him and this man stepped toward Rick. And so once, so Rick posed this question to the Lord because he's in this, he's, he's seated with him in his throne. He has become love. Now listen, one thing, and this is why the Lord does it. As much as it hurts God's heart, the Lord did not take him out of his situation. Why? Because the difficulty and the suffering was infusing in this man a love that the world was not worthy of. A love grew in this man that would not have grown any other way. Now you have to understand this. I don't, I don't understand fully why, but this is what the scripture says. Because God knows everything. We come into the world and the Lord gives each one of us a measure of things. And one thing that the Lord said to Rick, because one day this man went into a church. He went into a church and sat in the church and they asked him to leave. And the Lord made it known to Rick that the love that this one man had was worth more than everyone that was in the church. Now, that's biblical. You know that. Love is a fruit. It grows. So, the Lord said to him, when I created this man, he had gave him a measure of love. And then he created another man. And gave him more measure of love. Let's look at it this way. Let's say one measure and four measures. One grew up in a Christian home. Embraced by Christ's love. The other one did not. Which was this homeless man. And the one that grew up in a Christian love in a Christian home, didn't take what he had and increase it. But this one who had only one measure increased it beyond the measure of the one who had four. Again, I don't fully understand Heaven's mathematics, as it were. But I know this, God is not in balance. God does not favor one beyond the other. There is a reasoning behind what God does and how he does it. In other words, 
There is none who have more of an advantage than another. Let me put it that way. Though it may appear that way. But it's not. Why? Because God always balanced the scales. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen. That means where sin, amen, makes itself susceptible to you as an individual. And you have to admit there are those who are bombarded by more sin than others growing up. Right? There are those who are abused mentally. There are those who are abused sexually. That are not in, in other homes. There are those who have to deal with hunger. There are those who have to deal with homelessness. Who don't in other homes. But God gives more grace. It may appear that one has more of an advantage than the other, but they do not. Again, look at the life of Jesus, born in a manger, ultimately ended up in Nazareth. Nazareth is like the ghetto, amen, of other cities. And that's where Jesus grew up. This is why Nathan made the statement, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But it did. Jesus. Do you hear me? Jesus. So Jesus proved what? Your environment does not have to destroy you. If you don't allow it to. Huh? The difference between the Lord and us is, amen, the Lord was a good student. Amen. Understanding who he was as a child. Growing up in the word and the things of God. Knowing the ways of God. Our ignorance have been our demise. Our ignorance have been our destruction. But God never leaves us, right? Right? God is always there. He's always there. So, after understanding all of this, Rick looked up at this man. And the man looked at him and said this to him. Remember my homeless brethren. Remember them. So, what am I saying to you today? Regardless of where you find yourself, Christian or non-Christian, there is no excuse, none, that we can give As to why we did not surrender to God. There is none. If you called upon the name of the Lord. Faster than a nanosecond. The Lord will help you. The enemy's job. Is to keep you from calling. The enemy's job is to keep you desiring to eat more of the tree of good and evil instead of the tree of life. Amen. He's good at it. He's very, very good at it. So what do we need as believers? What do we need as people of this planet? We need a revelation of who Jesus is. Back to what I said before, brother, sister. There is a great responsibility on you as Christians. Amen. 
to make known this revelation. The Bible said you are living epistles read of men. Every day of your life that you get out of your bed, wherever you go throughout the day, what is your life reflecting? How are people reading you? See, brother, says the people don't need to be around you to see your deeds, to be aware of who you are. There are people out there who have more darkness in them than others. There are people out there who have more demons in them than others. And them demons are very much aware of who you are and who you claim to be. I say all the time, people should sense you before they see you. Huh? They should perceive who you are before they know you. It is a spiritual awareness. Huh? For instance, if you get around anybody who are spiritualists or psychics, they read your aura, <laughs> what emanates from you. If you ever encountered psychics, the first thing out of their mouth, if you're a believer, oh, you have a strong aura. <laughs> it's the light that emanates from you. That's all it is. It's a light. The more you suffer, and I'm not talking about you being abused by the enemy. <laughs> to suffer is simply comes from a decision that you made to live right. Amen. When you make a decision to live right, darkness targets you. Amen. It's just like wearing a target on your back. And the enemy will use people to try to drain you spiritually. Huh? Amen. And the first people he would use, try to use, is the ones closest to you. Huh? Because humanly, humanly, if you allow yourself to be impacted by that, the first thing humanly you want to do is give up. When you are not loved by those who are supposed to love you. When you are not loved by those who are supposed to care for you. Huh? Remember now. A big tool in Satan's arsenal is rejection. The Bible said concerning Jesus, he came to his own and his own received him not. Huh? Once Jesus accepted his calling, once he accepted who he really was and what he was called to do, then the rejection began in his life. Huh? His own brothers and sisters found it difficult to relate to him. Amen. When he acknowledged his call to preach, you know the story, in his own hometown at the age of 30, around about 30, he went back to his hometown. And those who knew who he was, they grew up with him. He went into the temple, the Bible says, and the rabbi handed him the scroll. And Jesus turned to the scroll of this writing. Of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, Jesus is reading this. Huh? 
Then he handed the scroll back to the rabbi. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but history say this. Flavors Josephus, a Jewish historian. In the, in the, 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 um, the, um, not temple, but what do the Jewish people call the place that they meet? Um, synagogue. There was always a chair out there that's placed there for the Messiah. And Jesus went down and sat in that chair. <laughs> Then he said to them, you would say to me, son of man, heal thyself. In other words, do what we heard you were doing in these other places. In other words, we want to see some healing. Now, this is his own hometown. His own people who knew him. Challenge. What was being challenged? They were challenging who he really was. Jesus came into his purpose, and his destiny. And his own hometown challenged him. His siblings challenged him. His mother never challenged him. The Bible says she, she would simply reason and think when certain things would happen. Huh? We knew we knew a man, Mary is the one that encountered the angel. Mary is the one that was supernaturally impregnated. Mary knew that she had something in her that didn't come from the earth. Right? She knew this. But what she asked him when he turned the water into wine. Jesus looked at her and said, woman, why, why are you asking me? My time is not yet. But he did what his mother said. Why? He never, ever rejects faith. <laughs> So his own hometown challenged him. But Jesus did not back down from who he was. See, brother and sister, this is what this is all about. This is about your identity. Your past life will reach up and try to grab you and deny you who you really are. Every time you yield to your past life, the life, amen, that you give up that before you knew Christ, amen. Every time you yield to it, you're denying, amen, who you really are, who you were destined to be. The reason Christ came inside of you, amen, to make you like him. You're denying that. And it does not matter, amen, what side of the tracks you were born on. It does not matter what family you grew up in. It does not matter. You cannot blame any of that. Because the Lord intricately watches over everybody, save or unsaved, amen, doing what? Endeavoring to bring them in to who they really are. But you'll never find out. You'll never know who you really are until the one who created you comes inside of you. Then it begins. It begins. A journey of reality. A journey of truth. The more you embrace him, the more you embrace who you really are. Amen? This is what happened to the man uh, Rick Jonah saw. Even on the street, the man became who he was destined to be. Huh? You may have given an anointing to reach uh, those in king palaces, those in corporations. He was given an anointing to do what? Reach those on the street. And he did it with every ability and the talent that was given him. What are you doing with the talents that were given you? Making excuses for who you are, where you were born, what happened to you is irrelevant. Because if you accepted Christ, amen, he rises above all excuses. Amen. He makes excuses null and void. He is the one that sets you on the path, amen, that you are destined to walk. Christ is. Huh? So right there in Jesus' hometown, 
right there, the first aspect of his ministry, the first place he gets a chance to preach. Say, whenever God puts something inside of you, whenever something new comes inside of you, whether there's a revelation, amen, uh, of knowing God, God endeavoring to show you who Jesus is or show who you are who you are, or God endeavoring to get you to do something. Whatever first steps you take is going to be challenge right there. And it's important how you respond because you may not get a chance to respond to it again. Do you hear me? So right there, right there, the Bible said, Now listen to this. This is a son of God with the spirit without measure. The Bible said, and there he could not do. He could not do any great works. Save he healed a few that were sickly. So what happened? So it seems that they... Amen. Were right. It seemed that they won the argument that he was not who he was saying he was because he could not perform mighty miracles. And he could not perform mighty miracles because they refused to believe. The Bible tells us that he could not do what he was destined to do because of their unbelief. Do you hear me? Their unbelief. Shut down the Son of God. Brother Sister said, unbelief stopped him then, it stopped him now. What am I saying to you? When Jesus comes inside of you, the Holy Spirit's first objective is to reveal Jesus in you. That's who you are in him. You have to believe in that. Do you hear me? There might not be a whole village, amen, or a whole tribe shouting at you that you are not what you are destined to be. But what is important is what you believe. Not what anybody else believes. What do you believe about your destiny? What do you believe about your calling? What do you believe about what God put inside of you? What are you allowing around you to influence what you believe? What are you allowing that is said to you to influence what you believe? It will stop the God in you in his tracks. It will stop the greater one in you in his tracks what you believe and this is what Jesus said all things are possible to them that believe it doesn't matter what life has done to you it doesn't matter amen What the past has created in you. It doesn't matter, amen, what the past has destroyed or crippled in you. It doesn't matter. What matters now is what you believe. What do you believe? Do you believe I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me? Well, notice the phrase, it's in Christ. You cannot do it apart from him. Unless you ponder with this Christ, you will not succeed. You will not overcome. You will not rule and reign. He cannot be in you what he wants to be. But rest assured, this Christ will let you live your own life. He will let you go your own way. This Christ will run up behind you and still try to get your attention through various means of the people. Amen. Pamphlets, media, whatever means he can 
to get you back. Let me end with this story. You know the story. The story of the prodigal. Two young men raised in a well-to-do house had the best of everything, did not lack anything. One young man woke up one day, decided to live his own life, to do his own thing. Now, here's the goodness of this father. The young man comes and says, give me my inheritance. Now, the father n- knew that all he'd do, all the only thing that he would do with this wealth is get involved in more sin. <laughs> Bring more death and destruction to his life. You would think the wise thing to do, this father would do is, no, I'm not giving you nothing for you to destroy yourself. But the father gave him his portion. That's a good father. And he went out into the world. The Bible said, riotous living. In other words, partying all the time. Partying all the time. And he had friends as long as the money was there. (laughs) But when the money ran out, so did his friends. Huh? It got so bad that he made himself a citizen of that country so he could work because he had lost all of his inheritance because he refused to walk in the ways of his father who had everything. And because of pride, amen, and not willing to humble oneself, He left. And the only job he could find was feeding hogs. Feeding hogs. And the Bible said he was about to eat the hus of the hogs that he were feeding. And he came to himself. Why am I doing this? Why am I living like this? See, that's what the devil does. He calls you to eat of the tree of good and evil. And the tree of life is standing right beside it. But if it's something inside of you that's dark, that will not humble himself, you will continue to spiral out of control. Him coming to himself was the grace of God. I'll tell you what it was. It was his father on his knees praying for his prodigal every day. What if that prodigal didn't have a father that knew how to pray? The light never would have came on within him. He came to himself. He said, I know what I do. I'm going to go back to my father. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to repent. I'm going to tell him, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me a slave. Just make me a slave. See, he came to himself. Brother, sister, many don't get that opportunity to come to themselves. Many don't. He came to himself and got up. Now, back at home, this father did something he did every day, came and stood on the porch of his palace and looked out for his son every day. He believed that his prayers would bring him back home. And one day, he sees the son coming back home. The son gets to the house, falls upon his father's neck and weeps. And the father is weeping. The son is repenting of his foolishness. 
The father saying to him, all is forgotten. That's a father's love. That's a real father. All is forgotten. So the father calls his servants, let's have a party. Dress the fatted calf. My son who was lost is back. But here's another son in the house. The father lost one son that day when he left. He almost lost another son when that one returned. The one who did not leave. Standing there with unforgiveness in his heart. See, he wasn't forgiving like the father. And the father says to him, what is the matter with you? He said, this one goes off, blows his inheritance with foolish and righteous living. And I never left you. I was right here in the home doing all of your bidding. You never made me a party. (laughs) You never gave me any of this. Notice how twisted his thinking is because of his heart of unforgiveness. The father looked at him very strangely. Son, All that I have is yours. In other words, he could have had a party anytime he wanted to. What am I saying to you, brother, sister? When it all comes down to it, it's what you believe. The truth can be staring you right in the face. The help and the hope you need can be staring right in front of you. It's what you believe. God uses people. Do you hear me? God uses people to lift the burden of other people. To bring people out of their downfalls, their destructive behavior. God uses people. What you must be careful of as a child of God, you must always be determined to walk in love. Because the very ones, the very one that can bring you out of where you are could be the very people that you have a problem with. (laughs) Amen. It is just like God to do that. (laughs) And you will not come out no other way. As you hear me say all the time, you cannot rewrite the book. You can, (laughs) but not to your advantage. You cannot rewrite it. There is a book in heaven with your name on it. And the angels of God that follows you around are allowed to read the pages of that book. And their responsibility is to bring to pass what is written concerning you. That's their responsibility. But as powerful as heaven is, as great as these warriors are, They cannot do it if they cannot get you to believe. They cannot. 
So my question to you this morning, what do you believe? Seriously, what do you believe? What do you believe concerning heaven? What do you believe concerning those close to you? What do you believe concerning those called to watch over you? What do you believe concerning the people around you? What do you believe? Because what you believe will determine your destiny. Even if it's not true. And there is an enemy out there to make you, make sure you believe what is not true. The devil is good at what he does. This is why it is so important to look unto the greater one. Amen. This is why it's so important to walk in the light. If you walk in the light as he is in the light. Oh, let's see what the scripture says. Very, very, very powerful. First John. If you walk in love, there is no occasion of stumbling in you. Love releases light. And light reveals what's in the darkness. So, if you are stumbling, if you are walking in the darkness, if you are tripped up by the enemy, somewhere in your life, you've stopped walking in love. I did not say that. This is what John said. There is no occasion of stumbling in him. So that means the enemy cannot stop revelation from coming to you. It's kind of like you're walking along, there's a big pothole there that if you step in, it'll break your leg. But a light shines and you see and you walk around it. That's what walking with God is like. There's no occasion of stumbling. Truth will always reveal to you what's going on what the enemy is doing, what he's trying to do, who he's trying to do it through. The question you need to ask, if you're continually stumbling, where are you not walking in love? Now, a lot of times we are looking for a person, a person, a living individual, when we quit walking in love. I submit to you something different. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I say. If you stop doing what he says, you know you should do. You're not walking in love toward Jesus. And the same results will happen. You will fall. Truth cannot reveal itself to you. Do you hear me? Ultimately, he is the one we're trying to please, not people, right? He is. So your first place you need to look is where I stopped walking in love in retrospect to my king. And then... Where did I stop walking in love in retrospect to people? Do you hear me? Stand to your feet.
Come on, bow your heads for a moment. Great and glorious King. We thank you today for the sharing of your heart. Your perspective on things. How you see things. How you see us. I pray today That the rebellious spirit that grips the heart of many will be broken as they peer into the light. I pray today, you great and wonderful God, give space to repent. to spring forth around those who grope in darkness because of the selfishness and evil in their heart. That you would cause light to explode. And for that moment, enable them to see. Extend your wonderful love to them. I know, Lord, many times you will not do this. Because if they do not respond, their life gets seven times worse. So you do not extend light to them. They grow up on in darkness. I pray, glorious King, that you continue as you will, Lord. Follow them wherever they go, looking for the opportunity to release your light. Increasing the chances of them responding to the light. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for being good. There is no doubt, Lord, that we are not worthy of what you do for us. All have sinned and fallen short. It's because of your great love that we stand today. It's because of your great love that we are not consumed. Because of your great love that heaven continuously put up with us. Thank you for those who fall to their knees in prayer for the prodigals All around the world. Thank you for those who never give up. Who never cast away their confidence. Knowing that the light will spring forth speedily. That they will come to themselves. In a brief moment they will see who the real enemy is. Thank you Lord. For all those who stand in faith for those prodigals. I pray that you will strengthen them today. Wherever they are. Encourage their hearts today. To not cast away their confidence. Thank you Papa. Wonderful, wonderful God. You are the great restorer. You are the great deliverer. Hallelujah. And we love you for it. We love you for it. Let's come on, lift your hands and thank God for his word. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Father. Let their light spring forth speedily. Let the glory of the Lord be their real reward. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for always loving us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for helping us love ourselves. Thank you, Father. Only when we love ourselves, can we love others the way we should? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. In the name of the King. In the name of the King. Praise God. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good. Amen. He certainly is.